Okay, let's go ahead and make a coordination for a small show. So the scenario that I've come up with for this is that we're doing a coordination for a school. The school has rented in four channels of SLXD, which is what we got here, and they've already got two channels of BLX on site that they want to use as well. So this is going to be super interesting because obviously the SLXD has an RJ45 port. It's part of the ecosystem that can talk directly to wireless workbench, but BLX does not have an RJ45 port. So we're going to have to manage this as an online device and the BLX as an offline device. So the first thing that we need to do is obviously get the computer and the systems talking. So I've networked all of my SLXD up into this switch here. And I'm going to go ahead and open Wireless Workbench. The switch is connected to this blue RJ45 cable here. And when I boot this software this time, I should see when I go to my network settings that that adapter we saw earlier now has an IP address. So this means that the laptop has detected a network, it has given everything an IP address, and I can already see that it has detected three devices. So we get three devices for my four channel SLX DRAC because my SLX DRAC is made up of two single channel receivers that are half racked together and one dual channel receiver. So even though this is four channels, because I have essentially three separate devices, they present three separate IP addresses and that is where the three devices comes from. So I selected the appropriate adapter this time and when I hit save, it's going to uh, then invite me to create a new show. I'm going to call this school show. Obviously, if I was doing this properly, I'd fill all of this out, but I'm sure we can use our imaginations for that bit on this occasion. We'll click finish. And at this point, I'm just going to go ahead and close the add new devices window so we can focus on the online devices that we have. So how do we know that these devices are online? Obviously, I can see it now in my inventory window, so this is more populated, but I've also got this green line down the side. So this indicates that there is a network connection between the laptop and these devices. There's a couple of things that I can do to test this out. The first thing is I can click uh, this little um, uh, like icon next to the green line to identify an individual device. So there we go, if I do that, I can flash it and see that this is indeed connected to the network. I can do it for this device and see that this is connected to the network. A really easy way of checking all of your devices are connected up and networked is with this identify all devices button at the bottom. So if I click that, it's gonna go ahead and flash everything that it thinks is on the network. And if you've got a big rack in front of you, you can immediately see if everything is online or if you've got some air gaps somewhere that you need to go and address. In this scenario, everything is online, we're good to go, and we can start sending information directly to these receivers. So I can do really basic things like adjust the channel name. So for example, if I type Jack, I can see that this on the front panel has changed to Jack. The alternative way of doing this would be to go to the device itself, go to the front panel and manually put that in, um, which is fine to do if it's a smaller system, but especially when you're working with bigger, more complex infrastructures, this workflow is much, much faster. And I can essentially control any parameter that I would on the receiver itself, I can do from wireless workbench. So I've got things like device IDs here. So what is the actual name of the network device in wireless workbench? I can control things like the IR presets. The IR presets are the information we send to our transmitters when we sync them up. Things like gain, things like low cut, things like RF power. All of that can be done in this window through the item properties here. So the item properties is kind of the important bit. You can do some basic things here. Uh, we can also kind of right click and see a few other things as well. Uh, but the item properties is the best workflow to get into if you want to send changes to individual devices. We can also select multiple devices and send changes en masse as well. If you don't have the item properties window up, if your screen looks a bit more like this, you just need to click that arrow in the top right hand side and you will explode out the item properties. So let's do something really basic. Let's try and reflect how this rack is actually built into what wireless workbench shows us in the correct order. So the best way to do this is with the device ID. So I can see here that the top rack is my jewel here. And at the moment, it's the bottom in the list of my devices that I can see. So I'm going to give this a device ID that I can sort by. So let's go SLXD1 for that top rack. 
So identify this one. I can see it's actually the last device here. So I'm going to make that SLX3. And that means that this top one is going to be SLX2. There we go. And now when I sort by device ID, I can see that my dual channel rack, which is the top one, is SLX1. Uh, this one here is SLX2 and this device is SLX3. So now when I identify in this order, it's going to be much more useful for me to quickly see what's going on, quickly troubleshoot things uh, and identify immediately what hardware is displayed in this workspace. The next thing that we should do is give these some channel names. So in the context that I've given you, we've got this four channel rack here. Uh, I think if it's a school show, performers are going to be swapping packs over and things of that nature. So I want to give these channel names something generic. There's no right or wrong way to do this. If you've got performers that you know by name and is always going to have the same transmitter in a live music performance scenario or something like that, you could give the channel the name of that performer and that'd be fine. In this scenario, just for flexibility, I'm just going to give everything a generic number and a name. So let's start with this channel one here. I'm going to go CH as channel and type one, and I can see that that is reflected on the front panel here of the device. But as we said, we can select multiple things and we can send changes on mass. So if I select all of these devices and come to my item properties on the right hand side, I have a channel name option. So I can type CH here and click apply. It's going to change everything to CH. But that's not hugely useful because obviously each device is going to need a number in order to display it by. So the easiest way to do that is with this auto enumerate from button here. So if I click that um, checkbox and I type 01 and hit apply again, it's going to count up from the first channel in the list to the last channel in the list until it runs out of digits. So if I only give it one digit, it will go to nine. I've given it two digits, I've gone 01, which will mean it will keep going to 99. This is a super useful, super easy way to send a lot of information to a large number of devices very, very quickly and speed up your workflow on site. So we have some basic stuff done in this window now. We can start thinking about our frequency coordination. Oh, we need to add the BLX, of course, that's what I haven't done. So how do I add an offline device when I haven't got that add new device window? Super easy, we go to this add new device button in the top left hand side, which is gonna give me that window back. Uh, I'm gonna scroll to BLX here. So I've got a few options for this. BLX4 is the single channel tabletop receiver. BLXR is the rack based receiver. And then BLX88 is the dual receiver. For the purposes of this, we're gonna say they've got two tabletop receivers and then I just need to select an appropriate frequency band. So we obviously select the device, the receiving device, and then we need to select the right band. Uh, every device that we manufacture uh, has a specific frequency band that it's important to identify that before you add the device in so you're coordinating with something useful. So let's go K3E which is the channel 38 version of that. I'm recording this in the UK right now. So that is the version of BLX that we would have. I'm going to click uh, add devices. We're going to add two channels here. So two devices giving us two channels. Click add. And then I can see those now reflected in my inventory window. So obviously there's no green line here because it's not an online device. When I make changes here, it's not going to send it to that device. It's always going to be an offline device, but it's still worth doing some basic stuff with these, such as giving them channel names so that you can quickly keep track of stuff later on. So let's go ahead. I'm going to say in this scenario that the two BLX channels are going to be spares. So we're going to type spare one, uh, spare one and we'll type spare two in here as well. There we go, we have an inventory. Let's cut across to our frequency coordination workspace. And to get those frequencies into our workspace, we're gonna hit this select frequency from inventory button. There we go, we're gonna bring all the frequencies from the inventory in. And if I zoom in now, I can see this sandbox, this kind of workspace here, starts to look a bit different. So I have some markers here, which are currently the, the white markers. These are uncoordinated. If it's white, it means that Workbench hasn't assessed them. It hasn't done anything. Uh, I've also got the frequency band overlays displayed. So I can see the tuning bandwidths of the devices that I have. Now at this point, I could just hit this calculate button here and Workbench will give me a coordination based on the information that it has. And at this point, Workbench doesn't have a huge amount of information. 
It knows how many devices we've got. It knows what frequencies they tune to. But what we don't know is what is going on in our infrastructure, what is going on in our environment. We haven't put any scan data in here. Uh, so the next step is going to be to perform a scan. Obviously, we can import a scan from a file using this here. But I can also see all of the um, online devices that I have to bring a scan into this workspace. And as SLXD has an RJ45 port, it can act as a scanner and put a scan here. So I'm going to select SLXD2, which is my second receiver. And when I hit um, scan with one source, I'm going to select one sweep, which means it will just do one sweep from its lowest uh, frequency to its highest one and display that information in this workspace. So I'm going to do that. That takes a little bit of time. So we'll pause the video here and then fade back in and we'll have a scan in the workspace. Here we go. We have a completed scan. Uh, and this is what it looks like. Uh, I've given this a slightly nicer color as well. If you've scanned and followed along at home, it might well have come up blue. But if you click this little color palette here next to the scan that you get, you can select whichever color you like. And just because it displays nicer, we've gone for this green color here. So we can see a bit more now of what's going on in our RF environment. This squiggly line at the bottom here is what we call the noise floor. So this is just general RF background noise. This is going to be generated by the lights, the electronics. There's a bit of RF energy left over from, you know, just general universe stuff, radioactive stuff going on from the Big Bang and all that sort of stuff. If you've ever taken an analog television set and tuned it into like just nothing or a radio system and tuned it into nothing, you get that kind of white noise. You're basically listening to this noise floor here with nothing in it. But there are a couple of things that are interesting in this scan. Uh, we have got this big peak here. This is the wireless microphone that I am using. I've got an AD1 pack here that's going to an ADX5D with Pepe, who's recording everything today. Thank you, Pepe. And as we can see, this is a huge bit of noise that we need to avoid. So if we didn't do this scan, we could potentially have coordinated on top of that and caused a problem. Um, we have another uh, frequency here, which I think is going to be a transmitter online in our service department. So our excellent service department is repairing something, a device that somebody has sent in, they've turned it on to test it, and we can see um, the energy of that device reflected here. Now, the reason why this device is so much lower in terms of level is it's losing a lot of its RF energy through the walls. But if this was at the school, if we were on site and looking at this, I would still want to go and identify what that is to try and figure out if it's something that's going to be on during the show, if I need to turn it off and rescan again. You always want to get a scan into your system that is going to reflect the RF environment you're going to be working in when the show's going on, right? So if you end up with stuff like this that's not going to be there, turn it off and rescan, and then you'll have a more up-to-date uh, um, scan. So we have some information in here now. I can, again, just click Calculate, and Workbench will find me some frequencies to use. Um, this has gone green because Workbench has factored it into its coordination as a device. So it's actually gone and found a frequency for that device and locked it in place and then made sure everything else uh, kind of lands around it to make sure we have the cleanest and most reliable show possible. Um, but at this point, I could say, yep, that's coordination and job done. But depending on where you are in the world, there will be some parts of this frequency spectrum that you are able to use and some parts that you will need to license. So I'm recording this in the UK, uh, in our Shaw building in Waltham Abbey, and we have a license for TV channel 38, which is this uh, section of frequency down here that I've highlighted. So actually, I want to get all of this um, all of these channels into channel 38 as part of my coordination. And the easiest way to do that is to deactivate the TV channels that we're not going to use. So I do that just by hovering over the TV channel here, right clicking and then clicking exclude and it goes red. And if I hit calculate again, it's going to do another calculation and avoid all of that red uh, section down there. So we're going to do that for all of these TV channels that I can tune to that I don't want to use and just leave channel 38 open, click calculate, and now everything zips in here. I've got my six channels for my show. I've accounted for this weird channel that's turned up in my scan, and I'm able to deploy this out to my hardware. A quick note, however, 
TV channel sizes differ depending on where you are in the world. So in the UK and Europe, we have eight megahertz wide TV channels. In America, we have six megahertz wide TV channels. That is important because when we go and get our license, we will be licensing uh, in America for six megahertz wide TV channels, which is obviously gonna affect the frequencies that we end up using. Now, if you want more information on licensing, please do attend or undertake one of our wireless masterclass training sessions where we go into this in a lot more detail. But the purposes of this, we just wanna make sure that we're in the correct country that we're trying to coordinate in. So if I go to wireless workbench at the top and preferences, I can go to coordination, which is this button here, and I can see my default country is set to the United Kingdom, which means that all of my TV channels are gonna be of the correct license type. If that is wrong, you will need to change it and then apply those changes and restart Wireless Workbench in order to get your coordination to be correct. But I'm happy with this. We've got six channels, they're all in channel 38. I then just hit this assign and deploy button here. This is gonna show me the uh, frequencies that I've got for all of my devices and the DBM reading as a star kind of um, setting. So everything is three stars, which is the top one that we have. Uh, for the easy run through of this, we're just gonna deploy all these out. And when I hit deploy, we should see my four channels of SLXD flash to indicate they have received a new uh, frequency to work on. And then I would take my transmitter and then simply IR sync it, so infrared sync it to my receiver and send that frequency over and we can get going with our show. So again, I've just gone and got an SLXD transmitter and synced it up and I can see that I've got RF, it's on the correct channel. Um, and this brings us to the last part of Wireless Workbench, which is monitoring that channel. So if I go to my monitor tab here, I can now select the channel strip for channel one. And as we can see here, I've got the RSSI, which is the Receive Signal Strength Indicator, so how much uh, RF energy is hitting these antennas at the back of the rack. I've also got an audio meter here. Now we can't monitor the audio, we can't listen to it, but what we can do is view it as a timeline. So if I tick this timeline uh, box, there we go, I can see all of that information over time. So I've got my battery information here, battery of this transmitter is quite low, I've got my audio information, my RSSI and the active antenna as well. And I can set this up for all of my channels, I can just have some strips, I can have some with um, uh, a timeline monitor as well and I can have this in various different views across the bottom if that's what we want to do.